Hello there and welcome to episode three in this brand new podcast series. Ox Talks is powered by Oxlep, the local enterprise partnership for Oxfordshire, and aims to give you more insight into the great work that Oxlep does, helping companies and organisations in Oxfordshire and beyond do business better, as well as having a positive impact on the wider community. I'm Howard Bentham and I'm speaking with some influential figures in the county, finding out how they're shaping and driving business locally. They're also all really keen to stress the critical support that's available from Oxlep and how it could be crucial in helping your company or organisation progress in the future. Although, of course, we are concentrating on Oxfordshire's businesses and issues in this series, if you're listening to us elsewhere, perhaps in another part of the UK, many of the difficulties we experience here will be very similar to the ones that you're facing where you are. Do share your thoughts, stories and observations with us, plus, crucially, the solutions to the problems that you've found. Head to our social media where we can pick up on your comments and questions in forthcoming podcasts. We are at Oxfordshire Lep on Twitter and Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership on LinkedIn. It'll be good to hear from you. In this edition, we're asking, how can we retain the best talent here in Oxfordshire? Undeniably, some of the world's most talented people work in the county with a host of globally significant companies calling Oxfordshire home. Last year alone, spin-outs, startups and social enterprises from Oxford University Innovation generated over £30 million of income. Pre-pandemic figures show that every £1 invested in University of Oxford research and knowledge exchange activities generated £10.30 to the wider UK economy. Many of these people and the organisations they work for are delivering critical responses to major issues within fields like energy, medicine and emerging technologies. But as one of the most expensive locations to live in the UK, how can we ensure that Oxfordshire retains and importantly develops the world's best talent for the benefit of everyone nationwide and internationally? It's therefore vital those with an entrepreneurial streak are able to map out a clear and affordable path to building a successful business in Oxfordshire. On Ox Talks today, we get the chance to get inside the mind of not one, but two eminent leaders in the county. In a moment, I'll introduce Dr. Rajashi Banerjee from Perspectum, an Oxford-based medical equipment software company. But first, I'm delighted to welcome to Ox Talks Chaz Bountra. Chaz is the Pro Vice Chancellor for Innovation at the University of Oxford. He is also Professor of Translational Medicine in the Nuffield Department of Clinical Medicine and Associate Member of the Department of Pharmacology at the University of Oxford. That's a mouthful of titles, and I didn't even mention that you were visiting Professor in Neuroscience and Mental Health at Imperial College London. Chaz, welcome. Great to see you. We like to get to know our guests on Ox Talks. Give us a, a quick whistle stop uh, life history, if you would. Uh, you're originally a Birmingham boy from first generation immigrant parents, I believe. That's right. Um, I did my schooling in Birmingham, I did my first degree in London, second in Edinburgh, and then I came to Oxford. And then I went into the pharmaceutical industry. So I joined a company called Glaxo. And then in 2008, I came back. So I've been here 15 years. And I have to say, I love this university and I love this town and I love this place. I can I can tell from the, the smile. I know everything I, I've ever read about you uh, says that you don't like talking about yourself, Chaz. Uh, but perhaps for everyone's benefit, listening and watching, pick out a few highlights, if you would, from your, your career, because um, there have been certain treatments that wouldn't be around, not for you. Yeah, I suppose back in 1989, 1990, um, we were the first to show that a, um, a, um, a protein called neurokinin NK1 receptor, uh, if we blocked it, if we stopped its function, then it would be useful in cancer and radio chemotherapy. And so we developed these blockers of this receptor, NK1 receptor antagonist. We did clinical trials in the early 90s, and we showed that it worked in patients. And now there are molecules out there. They're being used every day to reduce uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Um, so that's a that's something I'm very proud of. Uh, I suppose the second thing is I'm probably most proud of 
some of the people I've trained and developed and mentored, etc. So when I was at GSK, uh, probably at least 30 people that I recruited and mentored, um, they're now sort of vice presidents and senior vice presidents and CSOs and CEOs and heads of research and heads of R&D uh, in big pharmaceutical companies. So that's a source of pride. Similarly, since I've been in Oxford, which is now nearly 15 years, um, you know, I, well, it's just over 15 years. I came to Oxford 22nd of January 2008. So um, probably at least 30 people that, again, I've recruited, developmental, et cetera. They become associate professors or full professors, or some of them have gone into industry and taken up senior roles, et cetera. So that's a big source of pride. Uh, and your, your pride is is, is tangible uh, from from what you're telling us. We've all, of course, followed the the incredible achievement of the development of the the COVID vaccine uh, with uh, the University of Oxford. Give us an idea of some of the other spin up businesses that are are changing people's lives for the better. You know, it's a great question. I mean, the great thing about this university is that we do attract superstars from all over the world. And, and these superstars are working on all the big problems that we're facing across the planet. You know, Banjo and I care about healthcare. That's our passion, you know, so we worry about dementia and mental health and rare diseases and cancer and AMR. And, you know, I could talk for hours on those things, etc. But, you know, frankly, the climate emergency is a magnitude worse, you know better batteries, green energy, increasing biodiversity, more food production, water, clean water, etc. But then we've got things like social inequalities or the impact of technology on society, etc. These are all enormous, enormous challenges. And we've got colleagues in the university working on all of them. Um, so I'm proud of things like Oxford PV, you know, better solar panels. I'm proud of First Light Fusion. You know, I hope that pans out quickly. You know, it could solve our energy problems. Uh, the Spectrum we'll hear a lot about from Banjo. I mean, a phenomenal uh, organization full of great people. It's a, a, I don't know how many people you're employing now, Banjo, but a, I think it's a great success story for Oxford. But in, in medicine, healthcare, there's lots of others, you know, sort of my colleague Richard Cornell created this company, Miro Bio, three years ago focused on inflammatory diseases. It was acquired by Gilead a few months ago for more than 400 million pounds. Uh, sorry, $400 million, but it's roughly the same. Um, then Carol Robinson's company, OMAS, you know, mass spec, um, very focused on sort of rare diseases. Uh, Danuta's company, Nucleome, uh, again, focused on sort of inflammatory diseases. Um, we've also got social enterprises. So a company called Sophia is focused on trying to help companies all over the world tackle, alleviate poverty all over the world, etc. So, you know, we've got commercial enterprises, we've got social enterprises, but importantly, we've got great people working on all of these problems. You're quoted on the university website as saying Oxford could become like Boston, Massachusetts. What do you mean by that? And, and what does Oxford need to do to achieve that? Well, you know, I, I'm a little envious of Boston and Stanford. So in Boston, of course, they've got great universities. They've got great hospitals. But they've got all the big pharmaceutical companies. They've got hundreds of biotechs and medtechs. But importantly, they've got lots of money coming into that ecosystem. Money from government, from money from philanthropists, money from industry, lots of venture capitalists, lots of angel investors, etc. And now, you know, in terms of biomedicine, healthcare, you know, this is real buzz in Boston. I mean, there's so much innovation and enterprise and commercialization happening there. And many colleagues who work there, once they go and start living there with their families, they never have to leave because, you know, they, if they decide to change job, which many of them do, they just move to another company or whatever within Boston. So the partner doesn't have to change job. The kids don't have to change schools, etc. So it's a great ecosystem. Likewise, if I look at Stanford, you know, on the doorstep of Stanford, 
they've got, what, five companies worth more than a trillion dollars. Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, um, you know, Tesla, etc. And, you know, what Apple, I think, is 2.6 trillion. Microsoft is about 2 trillion. Um, Alphabet Google is about 2 trillion. Amazon is about 1.7 and Tesla's one, you know. Now, you can imagine the job opportunities for kids in Stanford in those five companies. You can also imagine the money that's flowing from those companies into Stanford. It would be great if, you know, one of our companies, Perspectum, some of the OMAS, Nucleo, and whatever, you know, became a industry, um, you know, creating hundreds of thousands of jobs. Because that's the important thing with those companies that have all been set up in the past 25 years. They've not just created a few jobs, they've actually changed the world. They've, produced, they've created a new industry, they've created hundreds of thousands of jobs, and they've produced lots of millionaires, and frankly, they've produced quite a few billionaires. So to get Oxford to Boston status, give us a, a few practical things that need to happen at this end. Well, I think, I think we've got great superstars. So I think what we need to worry about... We've got the raw materials, basically. Yeah. We need to retain them here. You know, many entrepreneurs, many innovators, many leaders will go off to the US. They'll go off to Boston and Stanford because there's a lot more risk capital there. You know, in Oxford, in the UK, in Europe, I hear colleagues creating a company and they say, if I had five million, I could do this. But in Boston and Stanford, they say, I need 100 million and I'll do this. You know, it's, it's on a different ballpark. And that's where we need to get to. So I think we need more risk capital. I think we also need a bit of a culture change. You know, I see students in Stanford, you know, they'll write one business plan. Before they've got that funded, they'll write number two and number three. In the UK, Europe, it's still very much you write one business plan. If you don't get that funded, you never write another one. Also in Boston, I have colleagues who, you know, they work in Harvard and then they go and work on this pharmaceutical company, Novartis, and then they'll go off and set up a biotech and then maybe they'll go back to MIT. I think that movement around is extremely good. So the collaboration, again, is a, <coughs> it's a real collab- key. It's collaboration, it's partnership, but it's also understanding each other's perspective, understanding each other's language, growing your network. Because big innovations are going to come by bringing these different stakeholders together. You know, you saw it with the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. That wasn't created just by the University of Oxford. It was great academics inside the university working with government, working with industry, AstraZeneca, working with the regulators, working with the funders. That's what we need to do. Big step changes happen when we bring together these different stakeholders and create a single goal, a single ambition, a single focus. But there are blocks that are standing in the way, potentially, aren't they? I mean, the cost of living and the cost of doing business locally is an issue. London prices for rent and property, Midlands wages for workers. You've got to square that one somehow. Well, I'm afraid, how there's not much I can do about that. But Except you're not a politician. The, the one yeah. thing I would say is that, um, you know, in, living in Boston is even more expensive than living in Oxford. And living in Stanford or San Francisco is a lot more expensive, etc. Um, all we're focused on in the university is using the talent that we've got, the brand name that we've got, the networks that we've got in industry and in government, the networks that we've got all over the world with our alumni, bringing all of those together, focusing on big problems to create solutions to make the world a better place. That's what we're focused on. And I appreciate, you know, if Oxford does become like Boston, house prices are going to go up more, etc. Um, people are going to have to commute greater distances, etc. But this is why, you know, this university has been such a great champion of the Oxford Cambridge Art Project, for example. You know, the narrative we've given there is that I don't look upon that as a a road link, rail link between Oxford and Cambridge, or a million homes between Oxford and Cambridge. For me, that project is about everybody saw what this university did in the pandemic. Now, all these problems that we talked about, they're all global, they're all big. We can't do them on our own. We need to work with the universities along this corridor, and there's about nine or ten of them, 
and we need to come together, work together and tackle these problems. So, you know, I think, I mean, Oxford's a tiny town. It's much smaller than Boston. You know, if we want to become like that, you know, we're going to have to bring in lots of other colleagues. What about the, the whether we physically have enough lab space or business space to accommodate the sheer scale of innovation? We, we absolutely do, do not. No. We need millions of more square foot of lab space uh, in Oxford. And, um, you know, what they're putting up in Boston is miles ahead of us. Uh, they've got a lot more of it in Cambridge. Um, you know, this university is going to be creating 30, 40, 50 companies a year. Those companies are going to need space. The 200 odd companies that we've already created, they're all growing. They're going to need even more space. And, and I can tell you just recently, just last week, in fact, we had colleagues from Birmingham who are putting up a, they call it a precision health technology accelerator, uh, right next to the medical school and right next to Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. So the medical school in Birmingham is the second largest in the country. The Queen Elizabeth Hospital is the second largest hospital in the country. And so they're putting up this sort of innovation center accelerator next to it. And, you know, the conversation I started with uh, Gino Martini, who's the CEO of that, uh, is, if our companies in Oxford don't have the space, can we get space in that accelerator? And, you know, the advantage may be that the rent in Birmingham is going to be less than in Oxford, but also you've got access to the amazing clinical patient resources in Birmingham. You know, Oxford's got a population of, what, 250,000. In Birmingham, they've got a catchment of 6 million patients. Can you imagine the clinical patient resources they've got? You've touched on this already, but it's um, <laughs> interesting to explore what the level of collaboration in Oxfordshire is between the likes of the universities, obviously, uh, thinking about Brooks as well, Harwell, Cullen, Milton Park. Does that ensure that great minds can collaborate and generate the best ideas? Is that happening to uh, it is. the degree and, it needs to? And I think Oxlab has been a great glue there. You know, th as you say... You know, we've got the universities, we've got all the companies that are being created, we've got the science parks, we've got the big infrastructures at Harwell and Cullum, you know, we've got the local politicians, we've got the politicians in Whitehall, etc. We all need to work together because I do honestly believe that, I don't wish this to sound very grand, but I think people and industry and society and government is looking to places like Oxford to come up with solutions to some of the world's biggest problems, to create lots of jobs, to create tax revenue. You know, we need that tax revenue to pay back all the money that we borrowed in the pandemic and the money we're borrowing to help people with their energy bills, etc. Has Brexit put a huge spanner in the works, do you think? Well, I was completely against Brexit. I think it was a crazy thing to do. You know, I, of course, I think globally and I like working with people all over the world, etc. And I like the idea of opening up markets in, you know, wherever. But to me, shutting down a market on our doorstep was a crazy thing to do. And, um, and of course, it's very hard at this stage to say what's happening now is a consequence of Brexit because... You know, we had two years of Brexit, then we had two years of the pandemic, and now we've had a year of the energy crisis and the cost of living. And so it's been a bit of a mess of five years, etc. And But, you know, one thing I do know is that within the university, you know, we get brilliant people from all over the world, but we are getting less applications now from the continent. Could central government, with, with just picking up on what you said there, could central government and indeed the local authorities be doing more then? In, in this realm? In terms of... Making uh, sure we've got the right people and we're retaining well, the right people because, as you say, the draw is Boston or wherever else globally and, and in Europe to, to head to. I think anything government can do to help us to continue to bring in the best people into this country or into the university, that's obviously got to help. Anything that they can do to accelerate visas and so on and so forth. I mean, fortunately, Howard, one of the nice things in Oxford is that... Um, Oxford's a nice place to live and it's fairly close to London and you've got access to the airport, etc. You know, so great entrepreneurs like Banjo, you know, that's what they look for. 
and you know, and they want nice schools for their kids, etc. And we've got some great schools as well. So. Before we uh, bring uh, Banjo, or uh, Dr. Rajashi Banerjee, into the conversation, let's just talk about Oxford Science Enterprises. They're an organisation that focuses on the business side of many of these startups. We've touched on uh, some of the, the numbers. Tell us about their role. I think they've been transformative, frankly. Um, you know, seven years ago, before they were set up, um, so just to be clear, it was called Oxford Science Innovation seven years ago. Um, they pulled in, what, 614 million of funding. And that was purely for Oxford academics and Oxford researchers to translate their science, to commercialize their science. So it was the largest VC fund aligned to any single university on the planet. Harvard didn't have it, Stanford didn't have it, etc. So it's a step changing. But before that was set up in 2015, in Oxford, we were creating maybe four or five companies a year. As soon as that was set up, it went up to more than 20. And, you know, last year we did 31, and we could easily do 40, 50. Um, but what we need in Oxford now is even more money. I mean, sort of uh, OSC, as they're now called, they last, last year pulled in another 250 million. But frankly, that's not enough. You know, for the ambitions we've got, the companies we've got, you know, we need to grow them quickly. We need to scale them up quickly. You know, we need first light fusion to give us green energy, not in 50 years time, but we need it in the next decade, etc. And that requires scale. And so we need to be pumping several hundred million into these companies. And so we need lots more investors, lots more space. We're trying to build more partnerships with global corporates, but we need more scale up entrepreneurs. You know, so it's a slightly different skill set. It's not just about creating a company. Yeah. It's about scaling it up to 50 billion, 100 billion, 200 billion, because that's when you create thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs. And that's when you really change the world. Let's uh, hear from uh, Dr. Rajashi Banerjee from Perspectum, uh, itself an Oxford University spin out. So, Banjo, as, uh, you know, you've, you've been well trailed. <laughs> Chaz, your PR uh, man, has done a, a great job. Uh, welcome to Ox Talks, Banjo. Tell us a bit about yourself, how you came to, to set up Perspectum just over a decade ago now. Yeah, thanks, Howard. Um, <laughs> um, a word to Chaz first, because I think this is important for all your listeners. Um, I came back to Oxford to do a PhD in 2008, same time Chaz came back from industry. And at that stage, as you can probably tell I'm Asian by origin, also uh, born of immigrant parents, there was not a single big um, translational academic Asian origin figurehead in the University of Oxford. Then there was Raj Thakur, who's a medical endocrinologist, and Chaz. And to have these two big names who in different domains, you know, Raj has learnt, discovered more about calcium biology in the body than, than probably anybody else on the planet. And Chaz coming from the world of drug development and changing the science of drug development. These are really big global figures we have on our doorstep. And, you know, and each of them actually is just a little footnote in the history of Oxford. So you know, before we get a little bit negative, you know, we don't have enough lab space, all the things we've got to do. Uh, over the Christmas holidays, I've got a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. I took them to a Chris Dingle um, meet. You know, you go to church, the story of Christ, but in the form of an orange with a candle. And in the graveyard of the church was C.S. Lewis. So we're going to wait for a little walk. And they're a little bit too young to read about all the line and all that, but it'll come. That's a perfect starter. And then through Christmas, it was really cold. So we went for walks around and you walk past the Florian chain building and you can say to your kids, did you know penicillin was purified here and given to the armies during the Second World War? And they do know about Captain America. So they know that his troops were kept alive with penicillin. And it was right here that they purified it. And obviously the bit they take away from it was recycled through we. So you could make good kids stories out of Oxford. And they turn on the TV occasionally if they're allowed to. And his Dark Materials is on. And that features Oxford and Oxford scientists. What we have here is truly unique because when you walk down the streets, you're walking in, not through, in history. You walk down Mansfield Road right now, one of the colleges being redone, and they've put up a mural 
of all the things that, you, that are done there. I've been in Oxford for over 10 years. Half of that was new to me. And I was like, wow, if, if I lived somewhere else, I would come here every weekend as like the perfect weekend city break. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So yeah. the, the important thing we have here in, in Oxford, and, and Chaz said it, but I really want to emphasize it. The caliber of the city, the caliber of its people is unparalleled. If Yale had even a tenth of the history of Oxford, you would never stop hearing about it. But the thing we don't do very well, we don't tell our own stories. You know, you land at Leon Airport, it tells you the whole history of Leon before you even got to the immigration gate. Oxford doesn't have an airport, and if you go to Gloucester Green, it doesn't tell you much about Oxford either. That's what we need to work on. How do we, well, we don't need to get all arrogant about it, but how do we project just some of the things that have been done here positively? So that, that's one thing. But, you know, for me, I, I came here as a medical student in 1996. Um, I trained, it was the best medical school in the world then, it still is now, so I'm incredibly privileged to have had that education. I then went to London to work and I came back in 2008 to do some research. A lot of doctors do research before they take up a consultant post and Oxford's probably one of the best places in the world to do it. Um, and then through that, we discovered how to map inflammation with scans. And that's medically important because it means you don't need to do biopsies. So if I want to find out about your liver health, Howard, the traditional method is I take a 10 or 12 centimeter needle, I stick it in your right side, I twist it through 180 degrees, no matter who does it, it's a little bit painful, and I take it out and I look at it under a microscope. And that's been how it is for about 70 years, but scanning technology has got to the point where we can do a virtual biopsy. It's called, in scientific speak, uh, magnetic resonance imaging uh, tissue characterization, or MRI scanning to assess tissue. And we've patented it and we've developed it and there's a bit of history there. The first MRI scanners came out of Oxford Instruments, which was the first Oxford University spit out. So wherever you go, doesn't matter what discipline you do in Oxford, there's actually a big component of history in it. That company was founded in 2012 before OSE. So as Chaz described earlier, you know, we had to find our own seed funding and networks came in and there's some really, really good people in this county to support um, young entrepreneurs. And that company now employs almost 300 people. We also run the Oxford Community Diagnostic Center so that post pandemic, if people need scans, they don't all have to go to the JR, which is a mess when it comes to parking and access. Um, and we've actually just opened an office in Boston for many of the reasons that um, Chaz has said. There's so many of our customers there that they want a physical perspective footprint in Kendall Square. What about the the attraction and the retention of the the, the superstars, as, as Chaz called them, the, the, the key talent. Does, does Oxfordshire still do that? Yeah. Well, Oxford produces it, right? You walk down these streets, you meet these people, you get better. And you have here in Oxford a critical mass of people to do that. Retention, so finding people and creating superstars is not a problem. But, you know, if you want to do it in football parlance, how do you become more like Barcelona and Real Madrid and less like, for example, Ajax. You'll note I didn't pick an English club because I didn't want to create too much tribalism. Um, Ajax has a great academy and produces amazing players, and then they do a few years there, and then they usually go abroad. I think we're at that pivot point here with Oxford. We've always had the best academy. We've always had tremendous history and style and flair in the way we do things. Um, and I mean that, like if you look at some of the solutions that have come out of Oxford, there's a flair to them that's more memorable sometimes even than the solution. Um, but you look at how other economies, and you look at the US, for example, where they've got massive endowments in the university to pull across professors, huge venture capital funds to support companies, infrastructure like we described in Boston and San Francisco, increasingly now in Texas because it's a low tax state. But it's not just the United States. Singapore has a biohub. The Middle East has grown some uh, environments uh, that are attracting our kind of companies over to them. So, you know, today, 2023, we think of our main rivals over in the West. You project 10, 15 years, the fastest growing universities are in China, Singapore, and the Middle East. And the likes of Chaz will be spending as much time flying east in the future as they are currently flying west. 
So the genuine issues then that you've encountered in, in keeping the best staff, is it a is it a competition thing then from elsewhere? What What is it that's you, you've got your superstars, but to, to stop being like Ajax, how can you become Real Madrid? So I can give it to you from our perspective yeah. and perspective. Having adequate capital, having adequate money in the bank helps. So if you look at typical salary structure, um, and I know Brits don't like talking about money, but we've got to break this. A, a junior scientist in a university will make between 30 and 40,000 pounds. And, that, and that's an Oxford scientist. That's a really, really high level scientist, right? That person in industry will make a little bit more, let's say 50 or 60, and they can progress to three figures. But the problem is the starting salary for that person in San Francisco would be $200,000. Now the cost of living in San Francisco is astronomical, but what you're looking at is a, is a, a scientist with a PhD and maybe a couple of years experience in Oxford, Headington, Cowley, wherever, on sort of 35 to 45,000 pounds, and they could immediately go to San Francisco for $200,000. And where we sit in the middle is, depends on where we want to be. So we have some companies that pay effectively that here. For, and they'll take like two of the best scientists and do it. And they'll usually, because they can't attract enough capital, then exit to, for example, Exact Sciences, which is a company called Base Genomics did here. And you have other companies that say, okay, we'll try and build up and make a lab more like Danuta's Nucleome, and I hope also Perspectum, and try and make a long lasting company such that my kids now walking through the center of Oxford, when they're teenagers and looking for somewhere that's quiet in the evenings to ride their bikes, will come by here and say, oh yeah, my dad used to work here and now it's got three buildings. That sort of evergreen industrial expansion is I think what fits with the university's ethos of creating an ecosystem, because that then becomes generational. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So the, the key thing about that penicillin story that I told you about with my kids is not just that penicillin was discovered there 80 years ago, but that people are still making discoveries in that building, creating the science that generates new drugs. And if we had more time, I could tell you more about them. But this was also an invitation for you to bring Chaz and me back. <laughs> the, the money is is key. So Chaz has talked about some of this I investment. Where does it? Is it a central government thing? Is it a venture capitalist thing? Who needs to step up to the plate here? Uh, the money's actually easy. Uh, believe me, the money's well, easy. If it's that easy, why, why are we not doing it? Very good question. So, uh, many things are easy, but people don't do them. Giving up smoking, right? <laughs> but the biggest problem with people giving up smoking, if you go back in time, was that everyone thought it was unnecessary. And then when you sort of put in the nudges to suppress smoking, you know, bans on advertising, bans on public spaces, don't, don't um, advertise to kids, all that kind of stuff. Smoking rates are re have really plummeted, right? Accessing finance is about wanting to do good things that other people want to support. We did uh, a financing round just now, raised $36 million. It was oversubscribed, so we've opened up a second close. What that means effectively is our current investors present us to other people who say, yeah, I want to invest in this company as well. And I did a call with a, a Boston investor last week, and after half an hour, he committed a million, million dollars, not quite a million pounds. Depending on how much you want to raise, that's 50 times half-hour calls, right? if you want to raise $50 million. But in order to do that, you have to have something investable and you have to have a team that's investable and you have to, you don't have to, but it's useful if you have a track record. In Perspectum, we have brilliant scientists, absolutely brilliant scientists who've made amazing products. You know, one, Caitlin recently built pretty much from scratch a digital pathology platform which you know, Microsoft now wants to partner with and brought in $11 million in contracted revenue last year from pharma because basically it outperforms any pathologist in assessing the liver. And that's one scientist who's built a multi-million dollar business and is now opening an office in Boston to expand it even further. I tell that story to you. If you had a million dollars, you'd want to put it into Caitlin, wouldn't you? Sure. Yeah. God knows how much you'd make out of her. Yeah. Yeah. So accessing the finance isn't the problem. The mindset is the problem. 
cultural mm-hmm. thing. I mean, and Chaz, you, you you touched on that, didn't you? That it, it's a it's a change of mindset, it's a change of culture. Anything you want to pick up there from Banjo? Yeah, saying? I mean, I, I think Banjo raises lots of great points. I mean, I do think we have to recognise that the world is becoming more and more competitive, and so of course I worry about. I want this university to stay number one, and I worry about Harvard and Stanford, but I also worry about some of these universities, as Banjo said, in China, that are shooting up the rankings, and they're shooting up the rankings because the Chinese government is literally pouring billions into those universities, etc. So if we want to remain number one, we've got to continue to compete on the global stage. Where's the line between com- competition and collaboration, because I mean, I can think of Kate. You've talked about the Cambridge Arc as the other university, if you like, on the other end of that arc. Where where's that line between collaboration and competition? Um, can I can I just make one comment on your earlier question before I answer that one? The, the second thing I would say in response to Banjo's thing is sort of, um, I think we in the UK and Europe have to be a lot more ambitious. You know, in the US, they go for these moonshots. You know, we're going to cure cancer, we're going to land somebody on the moon, we're going to take people to Mars, etc., etc. In Europe, if somebody comes up with these big dreams and big goals, 10 people immediately jump on that individual and say, oh, you'll never do it, you, it sounds really risky, you'll never get the funding for it, etc. Whereas in the US, because there's so much more risk capital, people will say, not give me a million dollars, I need 200 million to do this. You know, it's on a different scale. So I think we need to be more ambitious. Um, So your question about competition and collaboration, it's a balance, isn't it? I I think one of the other things I often say to colleagues is we have to be humble. And by that, I mean, we have to recognize what we're not good at or what somebody else is better than us at. Because, you know, Oxford's got brilliant people and it's got great infrastructure, we can't be brilliant at everything, right? And so we need to recognize there are other organizations, other institutions, other countries, other people who have got some expertise that we don't have. They have a technology that we don't have. Now, the fact is, the problems we're trying to tackle are so urgent, we don't have time to duplicate those technologies. So we have to collaborate. We have to partner. You know, I think the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine story is a Beautiful example. You know, this university, Sarah Gilbert, Adrian Hill, set up Vaxitech, and then, you know, with the help of our VC, Louise Richardson, former VC, and John Bell, our Regis professor, they pulled in AstraZeneca, they pulled in the UK government, the regulators, the funders. And it was a recognition that, you know, this university cannot produce three billion samples of the vaccine. This university can't distribute those three billion samples all over the world. That's where we needed AstraZeneca, you know. And and I should also say in that project, in the pandemic, funding was not limiting. I mean, in this university, we had our alumni sending in money saying, do use this money to do COVID research. We had funding from government. We had funding from these different funders. And of course, AstraZeneca put in, I don't know, how many how many hundreds of millions, probably billions, et cetera. So, you know, you can, you can be number one and we want to stay number one. We want to be world leading. We want to attract the very best, et cetera. But to tackle these big problems... I don't think anybody can do it on their own, any organization. So, you know, we have to work with these different stakeholders. Banjo, you've been nodding furiously uh, to, to what Chaz is saying. Do you want to uh, just pick up on any of those points? I just think he's absolutely right. Oxford is basically the academic general of the world. I know it means I ruled out a job at 50 other universities. I don't care. If there was... You remember in the 90s, there was a bunch of disaster films, Independence Day, Deep Impact, all that sort of stuff? If there was an imminent global disaster, you would want to pick your brains from within this county. Not to do all the work, but to work out what the plan of action would be. The the vaccine story is perfect. Uh, That's essentially the same thing. We're not going to make three billion samples. We're not even going to necessarily tell you how to distribute it. But we can we can do the whiteboarding 
better than anybody else on the planet. And that, and that's what I mean about the, uh, it, it, it's in the pavements. It really is. The flair for elegant solutions under pressure is in this city. I don't know if I, I can communicate well, that any better than that. Well, maybe, and, maybe yeah. if I could just add to that, Banjo, and just this is following on from your flair, elegance, comment, etc. So, you know, when we created that vaccine, uh, and I take no credit for this, this was my colleagues, they agreed with AstraZeneca and the government that we're going to produce this vaccine and we're going to give it away at cost price. So anybody in low-income countries, in middle-income countries, in high-income countries, you know, during the pandemic, they would get this vaccine at cost price. So the university was going to make no money, and AstraZeneca was going to make no money. Now, bear in mind, in that first year of the pandemic, Pfizer, I don't know, I think they probably made close to 30 billion or something from their vaccine. Moderna made 20 billion or something. AstraZeneca made zero. This university made zero. And I would argue, I don't think there's any other university on the planet that would have done that. I don't think Harvard would have done it. Stanford wouldn't have done it. I don't think Cambridge would have done it. So, you know, there was a pandemic. We desperately needed to get out of it. This university pulled its network together and we created a solution. And it wasn't about making money for the university. It was... The focus was we need to get the world out of the pandemic. Let's bring into the conversation Oxlep's communications manager, Rob Panting. Rob, we've been talking about the availability of lab space locally in our discussions. Worth mentioning the many hundreds of thousands of pounds that have gone into the Headington Life Science Laboratory development with funding secured by Oxlep. Yeah, thanks, Howard. Uh, similar to previous uh, discussions we've had in, in earlier podcasts, our role is to find uh, opportunities for investment and clearly, as, as both Chaz and Banjo have, uh, have said, life sciences is a, is a huge uh, sector for Oxfordshire. It has a, a global footprint uh, in terms of what we create in Oxfordshire. So um, the Wood Centre for Innovation, we've uh, secured local growth fund investment to generate uh, additional lab space for the Oxford Trust um, and really create uh, not only space, but also, I guess, a, a concerted business journey for these fantastic companies that are emerging from uh, within Oxfordshire. Rob, Oxlep co-sponsored a vital event uh, locally called Ox to Zero. I know Chaz was a, a key figure in this. Explain how Ox to Zero aligns with the discussion we've been having today. Yeah, I think our role as a as a local enterprise partnership is to continue to create platforms to showcase Oxfordshire on a, on a global level and Ox to Zero, um, an inaugural event working with the university, uh, with Harwell and the UK AEA at Cullum was to really showcase the, um, the, the really great work that Oxfordshire is doing around um, addressing the climate change. So great discussions around fusion, uh, electric vehicles as well, you know, huge potential that sits across those many different sites, the R&D that's being developed in those areas as well. So, um, you know, it's a quite an easy sell for an organisation like Oxlep to talk about the great uh, potential and capabilities that exist within Oxfordshire. And um, we're determined to work in partnership with uh, with those organisations to, to create uh, further Ox to Zero events and similar events too. Chaz, you were driving force uh, behind Ox to Zero. Perhaps tell us a little bit more about your involvement. The reason we organised that meeting Ox to Zero last September in, in the Blavatnik School of Government was that we wanted to bring together the whole community in Oxfordshire working on the climate emergency and thinking about better batteries, green energy, biodiversity, food production, water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we wanted to put a bit of a flag in the sand that Oxfordshire is serious about this. And we had at that meeting, we had colleagues not just from within the university, but we had colleagues from some of the companies that we'd created. We had colleagues from the science parks. We had colleagues from Harwell and Cullum, etc. We had some media people. And, you know, so that was the start. And I think the intention is to make that a regular event. 
Chaz and Banjo, thank you both for the moment. We will chat again shortly. It's good to have you along for Ox Talks, the brand new podcast series powered by the Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership. If you want to get in touch with the team at Oxlep and comment on what you've been hearing, find us on social media. We're on Twitter at Oxfordshire Lep or via LinkedIn, search for Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership. Perhaps you run a company or organisation that's looking for some specific help or simply need a steer to the most appropriate business advice available. Why not try the Oxlep Business Support Tool? Oxlep's Business Support Tool is here to help your company. Whether you're just starting out, growing or ready to take on a new business challenge. If you're looking for the latest advice and support, complete our business support tool today and get set to receive a bespoke action plan for your organisation. Head to OxfordshireLEP.com to find out more. Let's chat more to Chaz Bouncher, Pro Vice-Chancellor for Innovation at the University of Oxford. Share another story with us, if you would, from a startup or a spin-out that you've been involved in in helping. Uh, Oxford Nanopore springs to mind. You you were telling me about so this. I, I've not been involved in that. Of course, we've all applauded it from the periphery. But I, I think that's a great example of a company created by Hagen Bailey, one of our great academic entrepreneurs. I should also say one of the great things in Oxford now is we've got a number of academics who are serial entrepreneurs. And they are role models for young kids and researchers, et cetera, et cetera. So that, I think, is very exciting. This is why I think Oxford's about to take off in this sort of space, et cetera. But Oxford Nanopore, of course, was created 2005. They did an IPO about a year ago. They're worth a few billion. What we need in Oxford, we need more banjos, but we also need more Oxford Nanopores. We need companies that are going to grow to sort of not just a few billion, but we need to help them grow to 10, 30, 50 billion, 100 billion, because that's when they really create tens of thousands of jobs. That's when they really start to change the world. And, you know, I think what we're trying to do in Oxford, of course, we're focused on big problems. And many of these big problems are going to require new platforms, new industries, new technologies, etc. But of course, as we said at the start, we also want to help the UK economy and we want to create jobs and tax revenue, etc. So I think more banjos and more Oxford nanopores. What about using Oxfordshire more as a, as a test bed, a live test bed? You think about the electric vehicles, uh, Oxbotica's electric vehicles that are on the roads, autonomous vehicles. Um, we, we've talked about living labs, perhaps, uh, with the, the vaccine again springs to mind. Is there a better use of the geography? perhaps, and the people? I don't know how to answer that one, Howard, but let me just say this, that in this region, we have got so many clusters. You know, we talk about life sciences cluster. Well, Oxford's got that, or Oxfordshire's got that. We've also got clusters in space and satellite. We've got clusters in green energy. We've got clusters in quantum. We've got clusters in autonomous vehicles, motorsport. We've got clusters in publishing. There is no other place on the planet that has got so many clusters. Banjo, you're, you're again furiously nodding. I'm saying the only thing we're bad at is fishing. <laughs> <laughs> let's, um, let's have a closing thought from both of you, uh, gents. Banjo, perhaps on you, on the, on the easier fixes, if you like, to encourage and, and retain the best talent here. Expressions of pride in the city, willingness to put your best foot forward. Um, don't be one of the 10 people that Chaz described who jump on an idea negatively. Be one of the people that goes, oh, that sounds really interesting. Let me know how I can help. Um, that I think each of us can do, a bit like stopping smoking, to make Oxford a even easier pe place to develop talent and in time retain talent. And then as we look outside, we have the stories to raise funding. We just need to unshackle ourselves and support from and recognition from other parts of the country should be a good thing. So it shouldn't be Oxford versus the UK. Oxford is part of the UK. We should be very proud of it. You know, in, it's not Cape Canaveral versus the United States in terms of rocket launches. It's that's where we just do our rocket launches from. 
that's what Oxford, Oxford should be for UK science and innovation. Jazz? I think Banjo said it all. I think we should be... I, I know it's quite easy in the current time, you know, you switch on the news and it's all very gloomy and negative and everybody wants the government to do this and this and this and this, etc. and everybody wants money. Um, so it is easy to get gloomy, actually. And um, But I think in Oxford, we have to be positive. We have to be confident. We have to be ambitious. You know, we're surrounded by smart people. We've got amazing networks all over the world. Our alumni are spread all over the world. They are very successful. Many of them want to uh, put back into Oxford, etc. So let's use all of that. You know, use our brand, use our networks, use our collaborations, partnerships, use all the talent that we've got. Be confident, be ambitious. And because that's the way we create solutions to big problems. I mean... You know, Bill Gates didn't have it easy. Mark Zuckerberg didn't have it easy. You know, Elon Musk didn't. I'm sure Jeff Bezos and sort of, you know, he works 24-7 or something like this, etc. I mean, if you're going to change the world, you need determined, ambitious, confident people who are not going to take no for an answer. Chaz Bouncher from the University of Oxford. Thank you. A big thank you as well to Banjo, Dr. Rajashi Banerjee from Perspectum. And as ever, thanks to Rob Panting from Oxlep2. And thank you for listening to Ox Talks. This is the third podcast in the series, and we hope you'll tune in to more. Find us where you normally get your podcasts from. Please tell your friends or colleagues. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a review. Feel free to share your thoughts and suggestions on our social channels. It'll be very good to hear from you. Remember, business support in Oxfordshire is just an email or a phone call away. The Oxlet Business Support Tool can signpost you to expert help in a matter of minutes. It's worth taking a look. Find it on our website, oxfordshirelep.com. Do tune in again to the series when we'll be discussing Oxfordshire on the global tech stage and why we should be backing business right now with a particular focus on supporting SMEs locally. And if you didn't catch the first couple of editions of Ox Talks, find out what Make Space Oxford's Andy Edwards is doing to repurpose buildings in the county to help level the playing field for disadvantaged communities. And also hear from the CEO at Blenheim Palace, Dominic Hare, with his thoughts on the visitor economy and if tourism is the key sector for all sectors to thrive in the county. Well worth a listen. But for now, from the Oxlet team and from me, Howard Bentham, it's goodbye. <laughs>